why don't we take a little time to actually tackle some of these perceptions, right? Right, and 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 go into some specifics of what it is that sometimes we hear about in right. either mainstream media or from politicians or pundits or, or, or other folks, or just perceptions that that honest good people have um, who haven't who haven't heard counter perspectives, right? Um, so there's definitely this this sensibility that's sometimes tossed around in American culture that that Islam is a, is a violent religion. Yes. Um, or that that Muhammad himself was particularly violent. Right. And so what, what's your response to that? If someone were to ask you in the Walmart parking lot, okay, um, <laughs> <laughs> I bring him to a studio and sit him down and talk. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, no, what I would say to a person: number one, statistically, that's not true. So f yeah. that's factually an incorrect statement. So there's actually a recent article that came out which. Uh, took the verses of violence from the Quran, the Old Testament, the New Testament. So the New Testament and and uh, and the Quran, uh, I think the Quran is 2.2 percent. They actually statistically put it out 2.8 uh -huh. percent in the New Testament, and then 5.3 percent in the Old Testament. So the Quran is not particularly more violent as a scripture, right? Okay. Um, but any verse taken out of context, we know that the Old Testament has a context, right? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a lot of the Hebrew prophets. Um, you know, King Saul and Joshua and even Moses and so on and so forth. So there's obviously a lot of military context to it when you're talking about right. some of the old prophets uh, that, that come up in the Old Testament and the stories. Um, obviously the New Testament was written in a context, right? So yeah. it was, it's, it's a different feel altogether. Um, the Quran does not, is, is not particularly more violent. Um, and in fact, as a social experiment. So I was actually invited once to the University of Florida. Okay. And if you remember, burn the Quran guy. Yes. Uh, Terry yes. Jones, who had the uh -huh. really cool mustache. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he protested, he and his group protested my being at the University of Florida. Uh -huh. And what I did was I took a group of Bible verses, but I took them out of context. Uh -huh. And I read them and I, and I said that they were verses of the Quran. Yeah. And people were horrified. But then I said, by the way, these are verses of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just so you guys yeah. know. And you know this as a pastor. Right. That if we were to just start opening up the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, his speeches at Temple Mount in Jerusalem and so on and so forth, you're going to have some serious issues if you don't provide context. But yeah. that's what's done to us all the time. Absolutely. And so, uh, and there's actually been social experiments on YouTube where people go and, you know, they, they took a copy of the Quran but covered it with a copy. Or they took a copy of the Bible but put a Quran cover on it. Right, right. And had people read it in the street. And so... The Qur'an is not a more violent scripture, factually speaking, and, and neither was Muhammad a more violent prophet, right, uh -huh. than, than others that came before him. But to the contrary, uh, his biography uh, is to the opposite of that. It, it actually shows a man that, that desired peace, that desired uh, a stable situation, a secure situation. Uh -huh. And it's, it's quite telling that the only way to portray Islam as more violent, or the Prophet Muhammad as more violent, peace be upon him, is by taking verses out of context by taking some of these erroneous narrations that aren't sure. authentic and then saying this is Islam. Sure. And this is, I mean, and that's the work of um, extremists of any, uh, <laughs> of any faith tradition. Absolutely. Um, and, and so we can certainly see that as, as a reality. Um, now, one of the terms that gets thrown around a lot in, in talking about kind of the violence inherent in Islam is, is the term jihad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm curious, can you explain a little bit more about what that means um, and, and how it applies to, to say, you know, Islam in the 21st century? Sure. Um, so the word jihad, and this is really important to point out just off the bat, it does not mean holy war. There's actually okay. no such thing as holy war in Islam. Okay. Uh, the word jihad means to strive. It means to struggle. And when you look at the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we know that the Qur'an was revealed over 23 years, over a span of 23 years. Yeah. So his prophethood was between the age of 40 to 63, according to Muslims. So the way that you can automatically uh, dispel any notion that jihad is inherently uh, militaristic or inherently violent is that in Mecca, the early years of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's life, where they were living under persecution, there were various references to jihad in the Qur'an. So in the mm -hmm. Qur'an, for example, um, there is a verse, وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِي That whoever strives, he strives for himself. This is in Meccan Qur'an. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا That those who strive in our path, we will guide him 
to our paths. Mm -hmm. So the concept of a personal struggle against one's own desires, the, the lower self and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the original context of jihad. And then as far as struggling against persecution, it's very interesting because uh, essentially what the Muslims did in Mecca as they lived under persecution, their, their uh, public displays of faith were nonviolent protests. So mm -hmm. when they would go out there and they would read the Qur'an publicly, they'd get beaten for it. And so uh, Allah says in the Qur'an, it says, جَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا kabira." That to strive against them with the Qur'an Mm -hmm. with a great jihad. So they would go out and they would read the Qur'an, pray in front of the Kaaba in Mecca, and they would be assaulted for that. Yeah. So the, the original mentions of jihad were not violent, right? Yeah. Now, there is a military aspect of jihad, which is to struggle against oppression, to struggle against injustice, to struggle against those who try to fight you, and so on and so forth. But it, it, it's not, uh, jihad is not inherently that. So there is an aspect of jihad, certainly, that's militaristic, that's to fight, to defend, and so on and so forth. But uh, the original uh, definition of jihad, or the original context of it, was indeed a spiritual um, struggle against one's own self. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so another thing from the, the Quran that, that uh, I've heard brought up in, in a couple different circles is something that seems sometimes um, contradictory, right? So there, there are parts of the Quran that say things like, um, there's no compulsion in religion. Right. Um, which which seems to be very, you know, kind of accepting and, and encouraging people to to develop their own path or, you know, in my own tradition, there's a line that pursue your own salvation with fear and trembling, um, you know, that, that kind of notion. Um, but there are other verses that seem to indicate that people should be should be fought until they believe that they right. um, might endure persecution until they come to that place of belief. Sure. And so how do you how do you balance those those two voices that are there? So as I mentioned, I think this is really important for any serious student of Islam and the Qur'an to really understand. Uh, we have uh, detailed sources and detailed context as to when verses were revealed. So right. we know exactly when each surah, each chapter of the Qur'an was revealed over 23 years. Now the, the argument of uh, someone who's anti-Islam would be that, uh, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, just threw in the verses when he found them convenient because obviously if you don't believe that it's a divine religion, then Muhammad is the author of the Qur'an. To Muslims, Allah is the, God Himself is the author of the Qur'an. The way that we study it is we look over these 23 years. So yeah. we find that between the age of 40 and 63, um, you have various examples. You have the first period, the first phase, which are, which are Muslims living under persecution. So. Uh, a minority being persecuted by a hostile, a hostile majority. Yeah. Then you have uh, some Muslims that fled that persecution and they went to Abyssinia, to a Christian land, because the Muslims allied themselves with the Christians. And mm -hmm. a Christian, uh, Negus, who was the, uh, the, the ruler of Abyssinia, a just Christian king, uh, took in those Muslims that fled. So you had a minority living with a friendly majority. So they were uh -huh. able to practice their faith without being persecuted. Then you have Medina, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, flees from Mecca 13 years later with a group of his followers, literally run for their lives and they're accepted in Medina yeah. as, uh, as, as the ruling class. So overnight he goes from fugitive to governor. <laughs> yeah. And now you have a ruling, you know, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as a ruler of a city and as, as, as an authority. So you have a minority or a majority uh, of the Muslims in Medina, but they do have a hostile minor minority. They do have some that weren't accepting of their new rule. And yeah. then you have absolute domination. Yeah. The last period of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he's practically the king of Arabia, yeah. right? So you have all these different contexts, which are very different political contexts. So yeah. the, so the I, number one, the Quran was quite consistent in being peaceful and, and throughout these contexts. And if you read these verses uh, and you take in consideration when uh, when they were revealed in accordance with the political situation of the Muslims. They don't become that bad at all. Um, so you study that and, uh, and then you realize that, again, the, the original connotations of jihad, the original connotations of a struggle, of striving, uh, you know, came when they were living under persecution and it did not manifest itself into them becoming an insurgent group or, or you know, uh, attacking people right and left right. so that they could get themselves out of that situation. So when you study it in that way, here's what you find. In Mecca, 
the, the verse that was revealed as a response to the frustration of many of the Muslims to not take up arms because they're getting persecuted for years and years and they're like, are we going to respond? Yeah. Is this ever going to get any better? We're getting whipped here. We're getting coal dumped on our backs. You know, we're being killed. Are we going to respond to this? So God reveals a verse that says, Respond to that which is evil with that which is better. Yeah. And you will find that your enemies will become your closest friends. Yeah. And after that, one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, becomes Muslim. And that's Omar ibn al-Khattab. So that was the first time they were able to publicly proclaim their faith, right? Yeah. So that came in Mecca. When they moved to Medina, the first verse that's revealed now as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is, or one of the first verses as he's now in charge of a city is, there is no compulsion religion. So there is no compulsion religion was actually revealed in Medina mm -hmm. when he's in charge of a city. Uh, to show that there is religious tolerance for the different groups that are living there and practicing their religion. And we even find that when he was attacked, um, when he was insulted, when people you know, uh, slandered him and said things about his marriage and so on and so forth, uh, there's a verse that's revealed later on in Medina, which is, وَلَا تُطْعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ وَدَعَذَهُمْ Which means don't follow, don't respond to the, to the disbelievers and the hypocrites and ignore their insults. وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And trust your Lord. So the consistency uh, that we find once we study the Qur'an chronologically dispels a lot in and of itself. Yeah. But there is this movement or at least a perception of a movement there that you know, as, as Muhammad comes into power, right. Right, that then there is maybe greater room of, and whether it was for political situations of the day or, or, or not, that, that there was more, I guess, openness to, to, to violence and, and right. violent acts taking place. And um, uh, there's this quote from um, Colonel Alan West where he said, you know, something happened to Muhammad um, in Medina. Right. Uh, the, that there's this transition. And so now we live in a world where there certainly are Muslim nations where there are, uh, and so should that then make folks nervous um, the, right. that there are nations where, where Muslims are in power um, and that maybe there's this acceptable change at that point right. um, or, or is that a misreading? How, how do we so the first, those things? The first thing again, so chrono Pope Benedict actually uh, got into a lot of trouble with the Muslim world uh -huh. <laughs> you know, when, when he quoted a medieval text okay. uh, in which it was suggested that the verse, no, there is no compulsion in religion that verse was revealed in Mecca yeah. when, when they were living under persecution. So it was like, leave us alone, guys. There's no compulsion. Let everyone practice their religion. Then when he came to Medina, then it was like, kill them wherever you find them, right? Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, historically, that's not true because this, the, the largest chapter of the Quran, which is uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, the, the chapter okay. of the, the cow, which talks about the story of Moses, peace be upon him, and the calf, that was revealed in Medina. So it's after Muhammad was in a situation of authority. And so he, actually one of the first things he did in Medina was he established what's known as the Medina Charter. And the Medina Charter, according to many historians, is the first constitution uh, in the world, the yeah. first example of a state constitution in the world, um, where he, you know, he, he establishes the rights of the Jewish population that's living in Medina. They, they have mutual benefits, so they will defend, because now he's acting as a prophet and as a statesman. Yeah. They will defend the borders of the city, so if, if they are attacked, if the Jewish population is attacked, then the Muslims have to come to their defense. If the Muslim population is attacked, the Jewish population has to come to their defense. Um, the Jews were exempted from participating in the Muslims' religious wars. So if there was a religious war, they were exempted. So it's a very nuanced uh, charter, yeah. um, but a very accepting and tolerant one. And that was primarily the, the, the other religious group that existed in Medina at the time was a Jewish population. So there weren't Christians, many Christians at that time at all in Medina, just a few here, here and there. Um, so religious tolerance actually came with his authority, with his power. I think it's worth taking like a moment and owning the reality that um, understanding religion is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not sure. easy. I mean, like, you know, when you start going into all the layers of history and, and things like that, um, it's challenging to really get a grasp of what a faith intends and, and how it should best be lived out. And, and sure, I certainly sure. encounter that in, 
um, in the church as well. And, you know, the ways that Christians wrote before anybody was in power before someone named Constantine, yeah, yeah, the emperor, yeah. um, you know, converts is, is very different to Christianity post-Constantine. So, so I do get a, a, a sense for that. Um, I think it's just worth a moment owning for, you know, for wh whoever's watching um, and for the audience here that um, these things are complicated. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think one of the things that makes us all difficult is that it's very easy for a politician to give a 10 word answer. Yeah. That is somehow appealing to, you know, a, a large group of people. Or because just say, look at Saudi Arabia, right? That's right, <laughs> or, 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 like, right. Just, just a throwaway <laughs> statement like that. And, and then it's like, oh yeah, I, I've heard a thing or two about Saudi Arabia. You know, <laughs> people, people can easily latch on to that. And um, you know what the largest Muslim country in the world is? Indonesia. Indonesia. And oh, they've, Indonesia. it's not an Arab country. Uh, they had a female president before we had a female president, or we, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about the current, <laughs> current election <laughs> cycle. I'm not going to make a statement about who I'm supporting or endorsing. But, As clergy, you know, we they, can't endorse anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you know, uh, it's, it's a very moderate country. It's a very open country. Uh -huh. um, so, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that people will say, well, look at Saudi Arabia. Look at Afghanistan. So, in Saudi Arabia, women can't drive. There is nothing in Islam that says that women can't drive, right? And so, well, they, we can't there, have There wasn't a lot well. about the cars in the Quran. Yeah, no, not yeah. really, you know, they, they didn't <laughs> used to. <laughs> but, but the idea of, of, hey, they used to ride camels, you know, it's the same There's thing. A, yeah, it's <laughs> similar, yeah, yeah. But the idea that we should be held accountable for, for every country that, that portrays itself to be a Muslim country. Right. Uh, and that is the representation of what what Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, what his governorship looked like 1400 years ago, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Iran claims to be an Islamic republic as well, so why don't Saudi Arabia and Iran get along if that's the case, if they're both Islamic states right. and republics and so on and so yeah. forth. So everyone, you know, it, they are interpretations, they are uh, obviously rigid, and there are things there that, uh, some things that, that would be in accordance with the Quran and, and with the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, and some that wouldn't. But uh, that's certainly not the representation. Uh, yeah. There is no modern day representation of uh, what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, what his, his uh, state would have looked like, what yeah. Medina looked like 1400 years ago. D simply because I've uh, heard a, a, a couple of things about this and it, it seems to come up. Um, one more thing on kind of the, the, the question of, of Medina and things that surrounded there. Um, you know, I have heard people make reference to um, Muhammad authorizing, you know, the the, the slaughter or, or killing a great number of Jews in the city of Medina, mm -hmm. um, seven hundred or, or or more, right. um, and um, so, and that probably plays into some per perceptions that that influence um, debates around Israel and Palestine and, and and a lot of other questions, and so I'm curious if if you can offer any more insight into into that. Yeah, there's a perception that Islam's an inherently anti-Semitic religion, right? It's right. inherently anti-Jewish. That Muslims and Jews have been at war since uh, since Islam came about. But actually, historically speaking, Muslims and Jews have not had uh, bad relations as 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 two religious groups. Um, in fact, we find under Ottoman rule. Um, we find in the, when, when, when Omar went to uh, Jerusalem, when, when Palestine or Jerusalem came under, yeah. particularly Jerusalem came under Muslim rule, um, that the Jewish population was able to worship freely and so on and so forth. And so the, the perception that Muslims and Jews have always been at war is actually not true at all. Um, even with the Crusades, the, the, story, you know, the history of the Crusades, right? I mean, right. Muslims and Jews actually came together in that time, the Spanish Inquisition and so on and so forth. Uh, so many times it was it was actually uh, Christians versus Muslims and Jews, yeah. right? So yeah, we have that <laughs> that's in our happened, background that's too. happened as well. Right? <laughs> that's so, happened. So, but so, so politics is one thing, right? So when you look at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there is this perception, what you just referenced. Did he just kill all the Jews off? Absolutely not. There is one incident uh, that took place, which was the uh, uh, Bani Quraida, which known what's, what's known as the tribe of Bani Quraida, right? Where uh, one tribe, one Jewish tribe, um, was accused of committing treason because Muslims were surrounded from outside um, by outside forces. The Meccans gathered a bunch of forces. They descended upon Medina. And in Medina, they built a trench to protect themselves. So this one tribe, and at that time, there, was a lot of, there were a lot of tribes that were sort of making their alliances. So one tribe cooperated with the Meccans to attack from inside. Okay. 
And so they were dealt with uh, by uh, the law, the law of Deuteronomy, actually. So, which was um, that the men would be killed and the women and the children would be taken as prisoners, as captives. Uh, that was that judgment was actually made by an arbitrator that was chosen um, by the name of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. He was an ally to that Jewish tribe, and so they were they were told to choose their arbitrator, and they chose that arbitrator. He made the judgment, and that took place. Now, regardless, now this incident goes many ways. There are many different things that are derived from this incident by people. It depends how you want to spin it. You could spin it, if you're anti-Semitic, you could spin it and say those, you know, the Jews always betrayed the Muslims, and you'll hear that sort of rhetoric, certainly, an inflammatory rhetoric that it's always the Jews betraying the Muslims and they could never be trusted and so on and so forth. Yeah. You'll hear it on the other side that Muhammad went after the Jews and killed all the Jews and so on and so forth. But there's a great problem with that narrative that yeah. At the very least, what we could agree upon. Now, as a Muslim, as, as, as someone who studied the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and everything that went into that incident, obviously I have a perspective on it. Sure. Right? That, that that particular tribe of Bani Quraidah did indeed commit treason and they were dealt with in accordance with Jewish law. Okay? But even if you don't believe that, even if you believe that there is more to it, and even if you believe that there is another side to it, and so on and so forth. To portray that as the norm of Muslim-Jewish relations at the time of Muhammad is very disingenuous yeah. because Jews did continue to live in Medina and they did continue to have relationships with the Muslims and they, there, it wasn't always tense. In fact, we find that the neighbor of Muhammad, peace be upon him, was actually a Jewish family and when the boy became sick, when the young boy became sick, he went and he visited that boy. Uh, there's a very one of my favorite narrations where he was sitting in a, and a young Jewish man brought him a glass of water and uh, he said to him, may God beautify your face. Hassan Allahu Ajak, may God beautify your face. Uh -huh. And when he said that to him, uh, now Anas, who was the narrator of this incident, um, you know, who was watching this whole thing take place, he said that that young man never aged, he never had a gray hair after the Prophet made dua for him, or supplicated for him, he made a prayer for him. So there are positive incidents there. In fact, even when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, passed away, um, he had dealings with the Jewish population in Medina. Uh, so he had debts, he had loans, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and he purposely tried to maintain a relationship with the Jews of Medina to keep, that, to keep that going, whether it was business or debts or so on and so forth. You also had some rabbis that accepted Islam, prominent rabbis that accepted Islam. And so you had some that accepted Islam, some that didn't accept Islam, some that had good relationships with the Muslims, some that had a very bad relationship, obviously. But to portray, to take one incident, where a tribe was, was killed, um, whether you believe it was treason or not, uh, and to portray that as the normative relationship between Muhammad and the Jews uh, is actually not true at all. And then obviously Islamic history, that which follows afterwards, uh, you know, uh, many Jewish historians would, would say that under Muslim rule, especially under Ottoman rule, that, that, the, that the Jewish population was able to thrive and able to practice and so on and so forth. So Muslims and Jews have not always been at war. Uh, now obviously in our time, uh, Palestine, Israel skews everything, right? We tend to view history now through that lens yeah. as if this has always been going on. Uh, you know, and that's, that's less than 100 years old. That conflict yeah. is less than 100 years old. That's a very recent conflict between Muslims and Jews, right? So. Sure. Uh, we should not look at history through that lens. Um, well, let's talk about some other things that are, uh, you know, certainly come up in, in have come up in recent history of, of places of conflict. Um, one of the things that that we've seen is uh, violence on the part of uh, extremists mm -hmm. in response to uh, depictions of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, in regards to, you know, I'm thinking about uh, the attacks that took place um, in Paris following the publications in Charlie Hebdo, um, and then even more recently um, here in Garland, which is not far from where we are in Dallas right now, mm -hmm. um, you know, a violent attack that took place in response to a situation where uh, Prophet Muhammad was uh, displayed, uh, and um, so where where does that come from? Where does this um, uh, those violent responses? Yeah, where do they come from? Is that is that something that, that you feel compelled by? What, what what's your take in, in the midst of that? Sure. I mean, look, when these things happen, uh, so so particularly first and foremost, just to clarify something here, that uh, here in Garland, for example, there are two hundred and fifty thousand 
Muslims, about a quarter million Muslims that live in the greater Dallas area. Not a single Muslim took it upon themselves to respond in any way to Pamela Geller's hate speech and to, the, to that organ. It is a hate group. They've actually been classed as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. They, they, they literally are a traveling circus where they go around in different cities mm -hmm. and try to provoke the community to get some sort of response out of them because that's what they that's what they feed on. They feed on the negative attention and on the responses and so on and so forth. So as a Muslim community here in Dallas, we chose to ignore it altogether. We weren't gonna protest, we weren't gonna respond. They sent protesters to the mosques to harass the worshipers at the mosques. They'd actually yell things at the congregants during the Friday prayers yeah. about Muhammad, peace be upon him, just terrible things, trying to get a response, trying to get some sort of reaction. We ignored them altogether. It took two guys driving down from Phoenix, right? And if mm. you think about that, you have a group of people that travel around literally like a circus, all right, and hold these events. And they're not from Garland. And you had these two guys that drove down from Phoenix, right, to shoot up that event, who were thankfully killed before they could inflict any damage. When they were killed, you know what they did inside? They, they clapped and they started to sing patriotic songs. They were happy they got a response. They were pleased to get a response because that's exactly what they feed off of. She immediately started tweeting out, Pamela Gutter started tweeting out, the war has started, the war has begun, right? This is exactly what they wanted. Uh, and it was funny because the Garland mayor was upset because they had to provide hotel rooms for all these people because none of them were from, were from, you know, from here. Yeah. So this, is, this, this all took place outside. So, it's, it's, it's very wrong to portray the response of a few people as the response of the Muslim community as a whole, right? Mm. Um, do we get offended when the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, is portrayed in a certain way? Absolutely, it's offensive to us. It's, it's just as offensive uh, as if Jesus, peace be upon him, was portrayed in, in, a very, uh, in, in a negative way to a Christian or someone who loves Jesus, peace be upon him. So, it's very offensive and we, we prohibit as Muslims, it's prohibited in our religion to portray the prophets as a whole. Okay, so any prophets actually, we, the, the portrayal of prophets is something that's strictly forbidden in Islam. Um, so when that happens, what do we do? Well, we educate people. We educate people about what that is. So we have a right, just as you have freedom of speech, to portray the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in, a, in an ugly way. Yeah. We have the right to say that your speech is hateful and ugly. That's also part of freedom of speech. And so yes, we will speak out against it. We don't believe that it's right to incite people. Uh, obviously, there are different dynamics in third world countries. In some countries, when you insult people, uh, they take to the streets and they break windows and kill police officers. That's Muslim countries and non-Muslim countries. That's just the way things work over there. Because there's no concept of non-violent protest and things of that sort. There's also a notion overseas in different parts of the world that government owns media because that's the way things work over there. So when they see things come out in the media, you know what the first thing they write is, why didn't Obama stop it? It doesn't work that way over here, right? So this yeah. concept of free press doesn't resonate right. with people overseas, right? Uh, and there are a lot of other nuances that are not taken into consideration. So for example, France, uh, the mistreatment of, of North African immigrants, the racial discrimination that they've faced for years and years and years over there in France. Uh, they live in the poorest neighborhoods. Uh, so there's already an animosity between the French people and between the Moroccan and the Algerian populations and so on and so forth. All that is just thrown out the window because, hey, look, they killed in the name of Islam. They killed in the name of the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him. And so everything else is lost. And that's such an unfair representation of the community for us to be held to that. Uh, to, to literally a few lunatics for the entire response of a quarter million people to be thrown out. Um, I was literally, I'll, I'll, I remember when the Garland shooting happened, I was literally playing football with my kids, throwing a football with my kids, having fun in the back. We were having a barbecue. I believe it was a Sunday, nice. right? And, um, and we're just like, come on. Like, we work so hard as a community to completely ignore this lady and not give her any of the attention that she wanted. Next thing you knew, she was on Fox News, CNN, you know, all these national news outlets. She was literally just, you know, loving the attention that she was getting. So, so those attacks, in, in your opinion, was a major setback. Yeah, um, and, and contrary to, to the way you understand, um, you know, a response to the that which is offensive. Um, yeah, and it's not it's not wise to do something like that to keep on poking at, at people's sensitivities and to keep on offending people like that. It's not wise. I mean. No one would take a, a, a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. And, and you know 
do stuff to it and then take it to the African American community and then poke at them with it. That's, a, that's an icon, that's a beloved man, right? Yeah. So what, even if it's a religious, whether it's a religious figure or a political figure, that's a beloved person. Yeah. So why poke at, you know, at people with those sensitivities? And the other side, by the way, of that is that, um, you know, the, radical, the radicalizing element of this, they say, well, this is the response to those who insult the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So you've got the, you've got the Islamophobes and you've got the, the, the crazy extremists and they're both saying the same thing. They're saying, hey, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is what they're ordered uh, to do. Now, number one, Islam doesn't promote vigilantism. Number two, this was not the response of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to insults. When he himself was insulted, uh, he didn't used to do that. That wasn't the way that he would deal with it. There are incidents and they're portrayed as normative, yeah. right? Uh, so there, there are incidents that are, uh, you know, where, where people, there's a, a particular poet, for example, that was, that was killed, Ka'ab ibn Ashraf. And, and you know, the, the Islamophobe narrative and the extreme narrative is that, is that this was a man that insulted the Prophet Muhammad and so the Prophet, peace be upon him, had him killed. But at the end of the day, this man was a warmonger. He wasn't, it wasn't because of his poetry that he was killed. <laughs> yeah. He was a warmonger. He was actively trying to kill innocent people from the Muslim population. Um, we find many other incidents where the Prophet, peace be upon him, was insulted himself in his face and he did nothing about it. He forgave, he let it go. Uh, his, one of his most famous companions is, is a man by the name of Abu Huraira, the father of the cat. He, he used to have a kitten, so he was no, known as the father of the cat. <laughs> And when he became Muslim, uh, in Medina, once again, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is an authority. Uh, and he comes and he said, you know, when I converted to Islam, I told my mom and she just started insulting you and cursing you and so on and so forth. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he didn't say, go home and take her out. Yeah. He prayed for her. Yeah. And by the time he went home, he found that her heart, she had a change of heart and she accepted Islam. Um, there's, there are many stories. There's a story of one time where the Prophet, peace be upon him, was sleeping under a tree in Medina and a man grabbed his sword and stood on top of him and said, who will protect you from me? Who's going to stop me from killing you? And he said, God. And the man was so shaken by that, he dropped the sword. So he picked up the sword. The Prophet Muhammad picked up the sword and he said, who's going to stop me from killing you? And he said, he said be generous, you know, don't, don't hurt me and so on and so forth. He forgave him. He let him go. So if the Prophet, peace be upon him, if this was not normative Islamic law, and I'm going to keep using the word normative because you can find incidents and you can misconstrue them and you can, per, you can portray them to be normative Islamic law and the normative response of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to insults. If that's how he responded to insults, who are we to kill in his name because he's been insulted? He'd be more offended by that than by the people insulting him. Mm -hmm.